Bond fans, I've always tried to teach you two things. First, never let them see you bleed. And second, if it weren't for Q Branch, then James Bond would have been dead long ago. Yes, Q has become a staple of the Bond franchise and a name synonymous with mentors who equip heroes for their journeys. Q Branch scenes are fan favourites from movie to movie, often providing a bit of funny business before Bond sets out on his mission. Now, obviously it's hard to think of Q without thinking of dear Desmond Llewellyn, who played the role for an epic 17 film stint over 36 years, but does longevity necessarily equal greatness? Well, not necessarily. I mean, there have certainly been at least a couple of other actors who've made an impression in the role. So, let's get right into it, shall we, as we rate and rank every actor to have played the role of the king of all gadgets, Q. Number six. Is it unfair to judge the first actor to play Major Boothroyd against all those that came after him? Well, possibly. In Doctor No, there was no expectation for this character or any template for him to go by. Um, but then, the same can also be said for Moneypenny, M, and Sylvia, and yet each of those characters were able to make a real impression in the first film. But then, equally, maybe those characters were just written with more colour and purpose? Nice and light, in a lady's handbag. Peter Burton is not an actor I'm terribly familiar with, and maybe if he was given better material, he could have made an impression in the role, but in Doctor No, the character's sole purpose is to take away Bond's Beretta and replace it with his iconic Walther PPK. Though not known by the moniker of Q, this is indeed supposed to be the same character later played by Desmond Llewellyn. It's a famous story that the name of Boothroyd came from a real-life guy, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Boothroyd, who was a fan of the Bond series and wrote to Ian Fleming saying how big a fan he was of the book. But why, oh why, did Bond have to use a lame-ass lady's gun like a Beretta? A Walther PPK would have been far more suitable for a secret agent, Boothroyd argued, and Ian Fleming obviously took this advice on board as the Walther PPK became James Bond's signature weapon, all thanks to well, Jeffrey Boothroyd. While the real Boothroyd made a lasting impression on the series, the same cannot be said of Peter Burton's, and perhaps unfortunately he was never really given a chance to be anything other than a placeholder for a more utilised actor to take on the role. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Number five. Yes, we really are ranking all of the actors to have played Q, uh, even the unofficial ones, starting with Jeffrey Bailden from 1966's Casino Royale. In this spoof movie, Q Branch is located in the basement of Harrod's department store, which is a pretty funny concept, but the humour goes downhill from there, with the scene in which Q and his borderline offensive assistant Fordyce, played by John Wells, equip Evelyn Tremble with a few gadgets, while non-sequitur and downright bizarre gags play out around them. Morning, Q. Good morning, Fordyce. New Man. Mm. <clears throat> the whole scene smacks of are you being served sort of 1960s, 70s British sitcom type humour, especially from John Wells, which probably had its time and place, but looking at this with a more modern perspective, it just feels dated and, well, not very funny. It's hard to evaluate Bailden himself in the scene as he's very much one of a half with Wells, and to be honest, I often forget which one of these guys is Q and which one is the assistant. Uh, fortunately, the next actor on this list was able to make something of an impression in the part. Number four. Now, it's not too often I'll praise anything about the unofficial Bond films in the series, but Alec McCowan makes a, for a fun and refreshing take on the Q character. His real name is Algernon, apparently, so clearly not intended to be the same character as Boothroyd, which maybe allowed McCowan to be, you know, a bit more artistic license with where to take the character in Never Seen Ever Again. Q Branch is represented as a ramshackled and underfunded department presided over by a bored and crackpot Q, who is actually excited to see 007 back in the field. His longing for gratuitous sex and violence is a far cry from Boothroyd's I never joke about my work 007. But for a one-time off shot, I think it's actually quite entertaining. The Q scene is one of the better scenes in the entire film and that's largely thanks to McCowan's, you know, really fun take on the character. Number three. As I learned from my predecessor Bond, I never joke about my work. Yes, after 16 films with Desmond Llewellyn as Q, it was eventually decided in The World Is Not Enough to give the character an assistant. Apparently this was actually at the request of Llewellyn himself, who in his advancing years was more than happy to share all the gobbledygook and techno-jargon dialogue with another actor who, you know, was obviously to replace Llewellyn when he retired. 
I know that Cleese is something of a controversial casting choice among a lot of the James Bond fandom, and certainly it's a choice that makes the direction of the character super clear to everyone, and there's very little wiggle room with it. While the Q character and Q scenes were often played for levity, Desmond Llewellyn was not a comedian, and while I'd say he had great comedic timing and could pull a humorous face every once in a while, he never went broadly comic. Not really. And then here comes Basil Faulty, who's flailing around in an inflatable sphere. It's not quite the same, is it? Seems well suited for the job. Now, personally, I'm a big John Cleese fan. I've seen his stand-up show a couple of times, saw Monty Python live, big Faulty fan, Fish Called Wanda. I, I, I love it when he pops up in movies. And for me, as a 10, 11-year-old, knowing that he was going to be the new Q, I was thrilled! In his first appearance, he's known as R, and is a bumbling foil for Q. Um, according to Cleese, R and Q were to coexist for a few movies before Q would eventually retire and R would take on the mantle. Due to Llewellyn's unfortunate death in a car crash shortly after The World Is Not Enough was released, this was obviously not to be the case, which is a shame, as I'd have liked to see them uh, together for another film. It's fun seeing these two play off each other. I would like to have seen that developed more. But it did mean that the R character was able to grow into the role of Q quicker in Dine of the Day, where Cleese does actually represent a more competent take on the character. It's a nice bit of growth, and the Q scene in Dine of the Day is one of the best scenes in the film, with Bond at first reluctant to call his new quartermaster by his abbreviated name, but quickly comes around to the idea after becoming impressed by by the gadgets and the car that Q provides him with. It's a nice feature to the scene, and it's interesting to muse about where the character could have gone in future installments. Now, 007, do try to return this equipment in pristine condition. I'll do my best. That's what I was afraid of. If his appearance in the video game Everything or Nothing is anything to go by, he'd have been a slightly more comedically exaggerated version of the character Desmond Llewellyn played. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and I'm happy that Cleese was able to reprise the role in, in a few games before he was unceremoniously removed from the franchise, but after 36 years of the Q character being a certain way, I'm surprised it took the filmmakers a few more films before they decided to reinvent and bring a different approach to this character. Number two... And that different approach came in Ben Whishaw. After being absent from the first two films of the Daniel Craig era, the inclusion of Q in Skyfall provided something of a relief for Bond fans, reassured that the character had not been retired completely. By far the youngest actor to ever play the part, Whishaw's Q is certainly a millennial, computer whiz, techno boffin sort of take on the character. A far cry from Desmond Llewellyn's version, who could you know, barely use a simple identikit program without mucking it up. It would have been really easy to make this character an obnoxious Mark Zuckerberg type, but Wishaw brings a good deal of warmth and energy to the part. He's completely competent at his job without being arrogant, and has a lot of nice little character quirks that help him feel real and engaging. Of course, we're only two films in with Wishaw, but he has a great deal of scope to evolve and grow as the series continues. One of the only real drawbacks of casting Wishaw in the role is that now that they have such a talented, known quantity of a star in the role, it could mean that the character becomes overused in future films. Indeed, now that pretty much all the MI6 regulars are name actors in their own rights, rather than a band of character actors they were back in the 60s and 70s, I do wonder if we could be oversaturated with M, Q, and Moneypenny in future movies? This is, of course, just a possible worry at this stage, and so far Wishaw's Q has been wonderfully utilised, coming to the rescue from behind his computer screen in Skyfall to actual field work inspector. Huh, I guess he got over that fear of flying for that one, then. Wishaw has room to grow and grow as Q, and especially considering he's still a young actor, I'd love him to play the character for decades into the future well into his 80s like Llewellyn, who is, of course, the number one ranked Q on this list. Number one. Totally uninspiring, right? The least inventive or controversial ranking in any Bond fan's world? Uh, like, no Bond fan dislikes Desmond Llewellyn. You can't play a single character for 17 movies and not become something of an icon. 
even with memorable actors like Ben Whishaw and John Cleese in the role, it's impossible to think of Q without thinking of Desmond Llewellyn. Even to casual moviegoers who probably don't even know Desmond Llewellyn's name, I, you know, they probably do think of Q, this middle-aged, grey-haired, you know, slightly older gentleman mucking around, tinkering in a, a, a cramped grey workshop with ejector seats flying out and umbrellas, you know, with razor blades coming out. He's so iconic, and that is completely undeniable. It's weird now to think that Desmond Llewellyn was actually only called in to fill the role of Boothroyd after Peter Burton was unavailable. Not that it made much of a difference to From Rush With Love, which actor was playing the role, as, as with Doctor No, the Boothroyd character is purely expository and devoid of personality. But moving on to Goldfinger, though, something quite wonderful happened, to which we can credit director Guy Hamilton, who gave one piece of direction that would go on to define the Boothroyd character, known now as Q, for the rest of the series. At the rehearsals, I was working at a desk, and Bond comes in, and I got up to greet him, and Guy said, no, 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 no. you don't take any notice of this man, you don't like him. And I thought, well, but this is Bond, this is James Bond, and I'm just an ordinary civil servant. I must admire him like everybody else does. And he says, no, 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 of course you don't. He doesn't treat your gadgets with any respect at all. That single instruction is exactly what the character needed. Could you imagine if Llewellyn had carried on playing the role as he had in From Russia With Love? The Q scenes would be chores, but instead, thanks to Llewellyn taking Hamilton's direction to heart, a character was finally brought to life and defined. However, in the next instalment featuring the character, I've always personally felt like the animosity between Bond and Q was pushed a bit too far. Same goes for You Only Live Twice to a lesser extent, but I think Llewellyn plays his dislike of Bond a bit too broad in Thunderball. The writing of the scene sort of lets it down too, with Bond behaving more like a naughty schoolboy, and not, not in a fun sort of way. However, by On Her Majesty's Secret Service and Diamonds Are Forever, Llewellyn had a firm grip on the character and starts to look much more comfortable in the role, probably because by this point he was a firm staple as M and Moneypenny, and much beloved by the fandom, and rightly so. After a curious absence from the series in Live and Let Die, Q was often on his highest form during the Roger Moore era. The chemistry between Bond and Q was perfect, and even though Moore's Bond would often get up to tomfoolery and take the mick, the relationship always felt cordial. Like, Q was just used to this stuff by now. He knows that Bond is gonna goof off, and he's fine with that. You kind of get the idea that maybe they could, you know, hang out at some, like, MI6 or his Christmas party. However, how the Timothy Dalton era utilised Llewellyn's Q is easily the best of the series. He has such a great energy in both these movies, and a slight bit of the crackpot inventor type of personality that Alec McCowan had. Never so much so that he broke from the clearly more demure style of the Dalton era, though, uh, but enough to provide the occasional bit of levity. Q going out into the field to help Bond in Licence to Kill is the character at his absolute best. It says a lot about how much this agent means to Q, and despite being pissed off every time a gadget or car never made it back to Q branch after a mission, he obviously cares a lot about 007, and it gives the character a great depth knowing this. Despite Llewellyn's Q very much peaking in License to Kill, he was the only mainstay of the MI6 regulars once the series softly rebooted with Goldeneye, and thank goodness for that, the three appearances in the Brosnan films work as wonderful final bows from Llewellyn, giving him some of the funniest moments in the films, including one of my personal favourite Q gags ever. Do please try and return some of this equipment in pristine order. Don't touch that! It's my lunch. It's kind of amazing when you think of how this character, played by this same actor, was able to shift and adapt and change as the decades went by, and pretty much everyone around him changed between From Russia With Love and The World Is Not Enough. Like, everyone! The producers, the cast, the director, everything changed, and he stayed the same throughout all those decades. It's an astonishing feat, and if it were anyone else without the warmth that Desmond had in buckets, then I'm not sure it would have worked with, well, anyone else. He completely owned this character, and it's going to be a very, very, very long time, if at all, that he has succeeded as being the defining cue of this film series. So that's it for this time, Bond fans. Do you agree with me? I'm guessing that 99.99% of you probably do, because I've never actually met anyone who would rank any other actor above Desmond Llewellyn. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. I'd certainly like to hear from you if so. So please, you know, leave a comment below or on my Facebook, Twitter, all those things. Um, and in the meantime, I, I, I think there was... 
No, no, no. There was definitely a third thing um, that I that I had to, to to tell you all. I can't remember what it was. Um, oh, yes, that was it. Always have an escape plan.